So tonight for us um, is about sharing some knowledge and some information, um, helping support small business. That's what we're all about here at JPR. Um, all of us here are uh, accountants with a, a large degree of experience in business. We've done some high returns and we've done tax, but these days it's more about businesses, helping them, helping them grow, helping them become successful. That's really what we're about. We want to spend our time working with successful businesses. And we've got plenty here tonight. There's a few who couldn't come, which is unfortunate, but it's what we're about. So I'm um, happy to take questions as we go, uh, comments, insights, whatever, in terms of what I present, um, because we're here to, to mutually benefit one another. Um, the particularly dark picture there that I've chosen to start with, does anyone know who that is? Any Game of Thrones fans here? No? No, that's a few. Good. That's the late, great Ned Stark. Ned, Ned is sitting on what's known as the Iron Throne. Now, the Iron Throne in Game of Thrones is what everybody wants. Everybody looks at it and thinks, I want to be there. There's eight different uh, countries and dragons and queens and kings and everybody all want to be there. And yet you can see the way Ned's sitting there, he's not particularly happy about actually being there. Um, and to me, that's a little bit of an ana analogy with small business and small business owners, that it can be quite a lonely, dark place that you really don't know who to trust. You have people running around telling you all sorts of things. Um, you don't know if you can believe them or not, and you don't know who to go for advice. So everyone outside a small business tends to think instantly that a small business owner is wealthy. It's absolutely no doubt, they're all wealthy. Um, they'll have really easy lifestyles. They've got lots of money. All their staff love them. They never, ever don't turn up. Um, all their customers pay on time. You know, it's just really easy being in small business. And we all know it's the exact opposite of that in a lot of occasions. Um, okay, so we'll go from unhappy Ned there, who I'm not sure why he's got that big sword. If it was a small business owner, it might be waiting for his worst customer to walk in the door, perhaps. And... Um, Deal with them, but anyway, we'll move on. Okay, so just to start with, to go from the past to the current and very much the future, in terms of accounting, bookkeeping, analysing your numbers, all that sort of thing, it's now all cloud-based. If you're not on the cloud, you very, very much should be. The transition's been happening amazingly quickly. Cloud accounting is fantastic. It gives you a direct live feed from your bank into software like Xero, uh, MyOB Account Right Live or Reckon. Your accountant can be invited in and get instant access to your figures and your accounts can be done one touch. So the old days of having a ledger, having someone input, someone code it, then someone fixes the error, someone recodes it, and eventually you get a set of accounts is long gone. So I don't know, uh, many here on Zero or live feeds? Have we got a show of hands of a few? Excellent. Not enough, but a few. So um, very much encouraging everyone to get onto that because it is the future and it's coming really, really quickly. Um, and if you're not sure how fast the world's moving, Scotty, if you can just show that other... Um, this is a great slide. If you like an interesting website, this is brilliant. This is Internet Live Stats. This is everything around the world happening right now. So on a daily basis, there's 179 billion emails being sent. There's a billion websites up and running, all that sort of thing. This is where the world's at and this is where it's going at warp speed. So if you're running a small business, you need to be part of this and you need to have cloud accounting as a starting point and Lord knows where we'll be in a couple of years' time. The whole thing could be even a lot quicker. That's livestats.com, great site, I love it. I look at it all the time, just to check it's still working. <laughs> okay, so we're all part of that whether we like it or not. We still get clients who say, oh, I don't trust the net, I'm not paying my bills over the web or I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. Seriously, come on, just get with the program. <laughs> Thanks, Scotty. Okay. So where will we start? Simply, the really simple one everyone knows is a profit statement. We're all sort of weighed down these days in tax returns and profit and paying tax on profit. Great, that's fine, but it's not really where you want to be as a business. And as business advisors, we can, we can do a tax return blindfolded. Really, we've all done them. Everyone knows what they are. There's a few technicalities. We know the budget always changes things. But really, a profit statement should be the starting point for analysing your business. The way we look at it, overheads are mainly about cost reduction. In running your business, it's prudent to trim them and keep them under control and all that sort of thing, but it's not where your business grows from. Your business grows from the top part of your profit statement. So while looking at that, and we all look at it, and historically we've looked at it once a year, now with live data and live information, we can look at these things daily, weekly, monthly, and really keep you up to date. And you can keep your accountant involved as needed in how you run your business and how you analyse your data and make smart business decisions. 
Um, okay, so what's behind that? What do we like to look at? So a really simple number that I love and I think presents a really interesting stat for every business is the average transaction value. Can we have a show? Any people measure this on a regular basis? Anyone? One, two, fantastic, three, that's good. This is a key number and it's a really simple number for you to, to look at in your accounts. It's one of the main KPIs, I think, that, that you can use. The chart here shows a, a typical business we've worked on where you can see the numbers are all over the place. And the question then is, what are the reasons behind it? Why are these average transaction values going all over the place? So a transaction, an average value, is an indicator of a whole lot of things in your business. Not all these apply to every business, but you can see it's an indicator of your volume. How many invoices did you get out this month or week? Turnaround times, productivity, product mix, how your management style's going, how your processes are working, pricing, discounts, seasonality is a big one. So if you look at your sales and just look at them at sales and think, oh, I'm up 5% on last month, well, that's a starting point, but it's nowhere near the finishing point in it being a small business owner and analysing what your business is doing why it's doing it and whether your decisions are the right ones or not the right ones. You know, we can all improve on them and we all make the best decisions we can at the time, but if you're measuring things like this, then you're gonna make smarter, quicker business decisions and we've all got competition and the quicker we, we move on things like this, the better you'll be and the better your business, uh, better position your business will be in. Here's a few examples of clients I've worked with in the last, um, last six to 12 months. And what I find is the client estimate is always greater than the actual average transaction value. Now, why is that? My thought is business people tend to be fairly positive people. They like to remember the big wins they have. They like to ha think of all the, the higher price products and the higher margin things they sell. If you didn't think like that, generally you wouldn't be in business, would you? Uh, the first one there is a solicitor. So I can talk about him, he's not here tonight, that's fine. <laughs> we won't crack any lawyer jokes or anything, I don't think, will we? Now, if I asked you, what would you think an average suburban lawyer's invoice value would be? A lot of people would probably start in the multiple thousands and go upwards from there. This led to a conversation, and that's what a lot of this is analysis is about, creating a conversation with the people who run your business and help advise you to see where that leads, to see what, with the right team around you, you can do with your business. So this conversation, his estimate was about $850 average value. The reality is about 440. Now that sounds pretty low, and it is, but it is for a reason, and this is what came out in the conversation, that he worked out his clients didn't like big bills. Okay, coming from a lawyer, that's not really, really earth-breaking news, is it? But what it prevented from happening was clients A, getting nasty surprises, B, taking forever to pay them, or C, not paying them at all. But his strategy of basically billing his clients when they got to that sort of number, which is about an hour's work for a lawyer these days, mm. meant that they got bills they virtually expected because they'd just been dealing with him, um, bills that weren't overly large, bills that they were happy to pay because there was no surprise in it, and then they moved on from there. So this strategy of having really low invoices for him actually worked. He had virtually no debtors write-offs and he actually had the lowest work in progress, which is unbilled work, um, I think of any law practice in the country. Now, when I had that conversation with him and we got to that point, I gave him a huge tick. At that value, I was giving him a cross, but the conversation evolved around why he did it, his business strategy around it, and why it was actually good. What we then got out of it was that he was also billing too many really small bills. So what we implemented was a minimum bill and a minimum price under which you just wouldn't do because the admin costs and the time and the hassle aren't worth it. So we actually ended up increasing that average transaction value by having the conversation, implementing a minimum bill or a minimum fee that they would bill at and go on from there. So it worked really well both to explain and, and confirm his strategy as being great for him and his client base and for us as advisors to come in and pick a few little problems with it, tweak it and move on and improve the system improved his business and improved his profitability. So that number to me can be used in every business in any way to, as a great indicator of what's actually happening. The others there are fairly consistent. The bottom one's an interesting one. That's about right. The clients knew very well what they were doing. That's a conveyancing firm where they basically have one standard transaction. They have only one or two large clients that they get a feed from. So they were spot on in terms of what they thought their average was, which is good. So it means they know what they're doing. 
the issue with it was that it had hardly moved for about three years. So when you're looking at it as part of the conversation, the last three years I think were about 980, 990 and 1,000. So you can see it, you can understand it, but as a business strategy and a profit-making strategy, it really wasn't working. So we're having some discussions around that and all the things that go into that, volume, pricing, client base, all that sort of thing, to see what we can do with it. So gross profit and net profit percentages. Note they're percentages, not dollars. Fairly standard, I know. We all tend to look at them, but I think a lot of small businesses get stuck in the dollar value and not the percentage. So looking at your gross profit and your net profit percentages shows you what you've got for what you've done. And as a percentage, that needs to be fairly high. I love to aim for clients having a net profit percentage of about 20% after their own wages. So you've got to put your own wages in there. A lot of clients fail to pay themselves or struggle or leave themselves to last which is the absolute worst thing you can do, I'd suggest. Um, and you can see this one, while the GP's are a bit all over the place, the net profit's been a problem. There's a whole lot of reasons behind that. But having the meetings regularly and seeing these numbers means at least he's aware of it. Live data, live current data allows you to have these decisions and try and move on and improve your business as quickly as possible. So uh, great charts. You know, it's the sort of thing we produce for our clients that have monthly data and we meet with regularly and it benefits everybody. One of the issues I've put in the gross profit margin there is, I think a lot of owners should be putting their own wages and costs in the direct cost section, so the gross profit margin reflects their own efforts. So it's a GP, because a GP after owners cost, at least a chunk of them anyway, because the owner's working directly on the business. They're working in all areas, they're wearing all sorts of hats, we all know that. So. Rather than just putting your own wages at the bottom and saying, well, I'm an overhead and there's my gross margin, I think a lot of them should be putting it up there and being really honest about what the true gross margin is in their business. Because if the more honest you are, the more you'll get out of these conversations and the information to be accurately assessing what your business is doing and how it's performing. Uh, and I think I agree with that on sole traders as well. I think sole traders really should be putting nearly all their wages up in direct costs and having their margin assessed after their own costs because... They're, they're wearing all the hats. Sole trading these days is a really tough gig, um, but you know, there's some, you've got to start somewhere. Okay, so in terms of having sales, having profits, having GP percentage and those sorts of things, the single, to me the single biggest issue is pricing. Pricing, so many people are reluctant to put their prices up. I don't know why, it's just a fear we all have. Everyone's a little scared about it, but it's the single thing you control most in your business. And that's where you need, that's where you'll make your money. It all goes straight to the bottom line. So this simple example here, I've got three quick slides I'll just run through, shows that someone who's making a GP of about 35%, which is not uncommon, if you put your prices up 10%, and 10% most people have a heart attack, my God, I can't put my prices up 10%. But in a business like this, you can drop 22% of your volume and still make the same profit. But when you think about numbers from that point of view, people won't be quite as scared to put their prices up. This one's similar. So sales cost and price on this particular structure here, we've got a business with $100 sale value, direct cost, overheads and profit. So it's just showing really if you do 10% increase in volume, reduction in cost and price, what it does. So while this one has the least impact in this particular cost structure, um, that's volume, reduction in costs up in price, they're very similar. The thing is that this is the least effective. So we all, so many clients focus on volume. We want more clients, we want more of this, we want more of that. Well, you actually don't. You've got to be so selective about who you do business with. Pricing is much more effective, not only to make profit, but to sort your good clients from your bad. The golden 1%, I love this slide. I show this everywhere I go. This is a, a leveraged approach, right? Similar cost structure to what we just looked at. And it, it goes to show you what you can do in your business if you're focusing right on all the important areas. Sales, cost and price, again, same column, same structure. A 1% increase in sales, then you leverage that with a 1% reduction in cost and a 1% price increase. In the way this cost is structured, you can see that profit's gone from 10 to 12.4. That's a 24% increase in profit by 1% movements. Now, that has to make a difference to anybody running a business. This is sort of made for maximum impact with the way that the example's done, but the principle's the same. In whatever business you have, the principle's the same. Okay, so customer criteria selection I was referring to before. 
We've all heard of Pareto, 80-20, 20-80, depending on which school you went to. to the old 80% of your revenue will come from 20% of your clients and 80% of your drama will come from the bottom 20% of your clients. <laughs> um, we all know that. And this is just something that we, we tend to use as a guideline, um, customer selection criteria. Every business should have it. You've really got to get past the, the terms of just taking anyone who walks in the door. If you're in retail, it's slightly different, obviously. Um, but the more selective you are with your client base, the more value you have with them, the better your pricing will be and the more profit you'll make. So that relationship, that leveraging goes right through every business. Okay, budgets and KPIs. I thought I'd give them just a little mention. The budgets is something, I mean, we've all seen the federal budget in recent times and how uh, important and how much drama that's created. A lot of businesses don't use budgets. They're very prudent, really good to use. And I've simply made that one statement there. Businesses that have budgets do better than those that don't. So the smaller the business, a lot of people think, oh, I don't need a budget. Call it a target. Call it an action plan. It doesn't have to be a budget. It just has to be something that you're aiming at. When you're aiming at something, you're more likely to get there. If you aim at nothing and you shoot, you hit it every time. We know that, right? So small business, a little bit of discipline, a little bit of knowledge and advice from the right advisor, targeted, you will get there much quicker and much better than others will. KPIs, you know, the average transaction value is a great KPI, but you need to find out what are the important KPIs in your business. What will work, what's important for you to measure in your business to make sure it makes the profit that you set in your budget and provides you with the profit and the lifestyle that you want. Okay, so let's talk about the balance sheet and what's in it and what it can tell you. Balance sheets tend to intimidate a lot of clients or confuse them, whatever the right word is, I'm not sure. But a balance sheet is almost more important than the profit and loss statement. It's a snapshot of your business at any point in time. If you want to know what state your business is in, the balance sheet is where you go to. Now, it might be a bit complex for some businesses, I mean, but with live feeds, live data, you can have an up-to-date balance sheet at your fingertips as often as you want. So really important. It has great information and correlates really to what is the key in a lot of small businesses, and that's what are they worth? What's the value? You know, very, very important to small businesses. The most important ratio we use, and it, it might look a bit complex there, but it's fairly simple, is what's called the current ratio. So in business, what's the most important thing you want to know every day when you get out of bed? And not only am I going to make money, but can I pay my debts? Anyone who has a company uh, signs a solvency statement every year to ASIC that says, we are able to pay our debts. Very, very important statement very, very important to know that you can, that your business is in that sort of state. So this here, and you've got it in the notes here, you can have a read. A current ratio is basically the current assets divided by your current liabilities. And your current assets are cash and items that can be readily convertible to cash, like your debtors, your stock, work in progress, what have you. Your current liabilities are the debts that are payable in the short term, supplies, ATO, credit cards, short term part of long term debt, all that sort of thing. So. It's a great ratio. Obviously, we've got a few numbers there. It needs to be greater than one. If it's not greater than one, it's an implication instantly that you cannot pay all your debts at any point in time. So if you get to that point, that's a wake-up call. Seriously big wake-up call. And that, on a zero platform or panalytics that we use, whatever it is, is easily obtainable. Even for a sole trader, you can get those numbers pretty easily. So seriously important. Um, on the front of the folder, I did have some questions, how well you know your business, which I meant to mention before, but have a think about your own business. Have a guess now, without having your numbers in front of you, what you think your current ratio is, what you think your average transaction might be, those things. Just, it's an interesting little exercise I was hoping everyone would do. Debtors' days and creditors' days, again, reasonably basic, but very, very important. Lots of clients focus on different things. Some will look at the bank balance, some will look at their debtors, some will look at their creditors, I don't know. But when you're looking at debtors and creditors, not just looking at the dollar amount of them, it's how often are they paying. So there's a simple equation there that you can take, take back to your own business and think about how often are people paying me and how am I paying my creditors, am I paying them on time? So the current ratio and these two numbers give you a fantastic snapshot of what state your business is in and allow you to, to really tweak things if you need to. So let's just move on to this. We've only a couple of points left to make. The last part of any balance sheet is the net asset figure. So that's your total assets, less your total liabilities, says basically what's it worth. What's, it's a great indicator of what a business might be worth. Um, it reflects the difference between what it owns and what it owes. 
And as a business indicator, it's a great place to start. Lots of clients don't do it. Every client should do it. If you're in a small business, if you're going to track your sales, if you're going to track your profit, if you're going to track ratios, bank balances, all those things, why wouldn't you track it through to what your business is worth? Right? It just, to me, doesn't make sense. If you're in small business and you hope to sell your business one day, then the quicker, sorry, the, the better you are at tracking that and keeping up to date with your value and what's happening in your industry, the better this will be and the more chance you will have of establishing uh, a value and a business that's saleable, that somebody wants to walk in and buy from you. Selling SMEs these days is really tricky. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, lots of people end up closing the doors. Those that run it tight, run it accurately, keep up to date with those in their field are the ones that can walk into any brokers and say, I know my business, I know this has a value. Here's the value. You can have someone come in and look at this and want to buy your business. If you don't do that, then you're really in business just to try and drag every dollar out of it that you can and put, you know, make money, put it into super, buy your house and all that, but have nothing left at the end. I don't see any sense in that. Why would you not want to have a value that's saleable at the end of the day? So just the last point here, this is a really easy way to come up with a simple business value. This can get really complex, and if you ask 10 accountants how to value your business, you'll get 10 different answers. We all know that. Andrew is smiling, she knows that <laughs> as much as anybody does. Um, we've just run through what we talked about before in terms of customers, transaction value, uh, transaction frequency, transaction value gives you a total sales or a total GP model, really easy. Take off your expenses gives you a profit, profit applied by a multiplier will give you, in broad terms, a goodwill figure. Really simple accounting logic, doesn't keep everyone excited and all that, but really for a business owner it does make a lot of sense. Add on your, debt, your assets, take off your creditors, and in a ballpark way you've got a really simple business value form there. And that's something I think every business owner should look at regularly. When you think about this, if you, ask, if you, if you say, what is the stock market? Right, the stock market is big businesses being valued every second of the day. They're getting people assess their decision making and their pricing and their transactions and their profit every minute of the day making assessment about the value and giving that feedback to that company by buying or selling their shares. Right? And the multiplier starting off at the stock market is about 15. That's a publicly listed company, completely audited, exposed, subject to scrutiny, which is why they get that multiplier. Private small businesses don't get that scrutiny. It's all up to you. So, and they don't get the feedback. So if you can't get the feedback from someone else, well, create your own. Create your advisor who can sit down with you and, and however often, once every quarter, once a month, put that number in front of a, of a business owner and it grabs their eyes. They go straight to it because it's important to them. It's the ultimate proof of the decisions that they've made every minute of every day in their business. So that's why I think that's so important and yet so ignored by, by a lot of businesses and yet it's a really valuable thing and a really simple thing to do.